All right, let's go ahead and go through chapter four. Let's see if our share screen is working the way it should. There we go. So first this chapter is about um, sound recording and popular music. So we can take a look here in terms of what's going on with it. Um, probably one of my favorite chapters in the book because I do play music. So sounds and images, when we think about it, any and all media can be consumed via the internet, laptops, tablets, smartphones, video games, consoles, and the traditional media um, corporations are kind of playing catch up with all the new online stuff. So we know we're, we're used to Amazon screen. We're used to Apple music. All those things are catching up at this stage. Uh, 20th century, we really had music, radio, television, and film. And then the 21st century um, is what's happening now. What form, how, how we're going to experience, we don't know. I mean, it's changing as we speak daily to a certain extent. So how did this all come about? It came about with um, from cylinders to discs in terms of the sound, how recording became a mass media. The milestones were really <clears throat> in the 1850s, De Martinville for France. These are all things you should really remember for the objective test that we have. Um, Edison's phonograph in the US was 1877, and then Bill and Tanner's graphophone in 1886, and for Leonard's gramophone in 1887. The Victrola, which was very popular, and you'll see a lot of images of that in the book. Then final records early in the early 1940s, and then 33 and a third um, albums, which really LPs, long playing was what LP meant, from 1948, and then the 45 uh, record, which was 1949, which we had a lot of those as I was growing up. I certainly used those. My mom bought those. So again, the milestones from photographs to CDs. So analog, we went digital, which was kind of a cool thing, but definitely improved sound. So in 1940s, we had audio tape that was real real devices with lightweight magnetized strands. I actually had a real real in college for a while because it was pretty cool. In 1958, um, stereo came about. So we had two separate channels or tracks of sound. And now we have a 16, 32 track, so a crazy amount compared to what we had in 1958. The 70s is when digital recording started to translate sound waves into binary on off pulses and stores that information as a numerical code, code as opposed to analog, which captures fluctuations of the sound waves and stores those signals in a records groups or tapes magnetized particles. So digital obviously is a higher quality. That's what, um, when you, even when you think of CDs or anything that's done digitally, it's much better. 1983 CDs came about. This is probably the, one of the bigger shifts too. So we, when I was growing up, I had cassette tapes and eight track tapes. And then in the eighties, we started to do um, the compact discs and it was pretty, pretty pricey to start with, but then once it caught on, it was great. And the MP3s, which was the music in the, in the cloud, that was the next big thing was being able to actually load things onto your computer or your device and play music. And there was a big deal with uh, music piracy issues that went along with that. So the evolution of digital um, sound recording sales, this is um, sort of neat to look at in terms of the when you look at from 1999 to 2011, 2017. So in 1999, CDs um, were about 88% of sales, cassettes maybe 7%, uh, vinyl 2%, and then other. So we fast forward to 2011, and then we had more like 7 billion, and we had CDs were yeah. dropped down to 3 billion, and digital download jumped up to, to 2.6 to almost 37%. And then you had mobile download, digital subscription, streaming, all those started at that point around 2011. And then fast forward again to 2017. And physical CDs and, and uh, vinyl are about 17%. Digital download is about 15%. But the streaming jumped up to 65 And even if you go to today, I'm sure three years later, if you look at the statistics, the streaming has, has gone even further in terms of the amount that's used daily. So this convergence to sound recording in the internet age, MP3s and file sharing was pretty cool. And again, it was developed around 1992, it enabled digital recordings to be compressed into smaller, more manageable files. So um, um, Livewire and Lime were the ones that um, a lot of the programs they had that people could actually use to try to 
download them illegally and that people Supreme Court declared free music file swapping illegal in 2001. So that was one of the big problems because everybody was used to getting free music as opposed to you, know, you could copy whatever you want songs you wanted. And then iTunes came about as a model for legal music downloading. And it really did change the music industry too. There's no question it did that. So the music in the, in the cloud deal is um, no physical ownership of the music, subscription and cloud services. Again, Apple, Amazon, Pandora, all those streaming um, platforms that we use are actually, you know, we, we've made a big change for me from cassette tapes to this has been drastic. It's been crazy to see the technology change even in my lifetime. So the relationship between records and, and radio has always been sort of a back and forth. Uh, record sales dropped off in 1924 due to the emergence of radio because people didn't have to buy it, they could listen to the radio. ASCAP, um, which was established for music rights fees for radio by 1925, um, really made a big difference too because then they had to pay for the music rights of things they played on the radio. Even today, bars and any of those um, jukeboxes that you go into in terms of buying, they're the bar is actually paying ASCAP for any of the songs that are played on it. So they're very vicious about doing that too. So ASCAP has been known to like a, a small bar might have to pay $1,500 $1, a month or something to actually have their jukebox in there. So, and it's changed now with the um, automated jukeboxes now where you just download as much different. So it's a little bit different um, situation on how they gain the, the money from too. Um, Began began to, to cooperate with, with um, television became popular in the 1950s and the royalty issue again rose with music streaming companies and again a lot of artists lost money when we went to music streaming they don't make as much on it so there was a big difference between selling albums and, and streaming and we know it takes a lot of um, plays to start making money on when you have streaming music. So the rise of popular music really came about um, Again, music that appealed to either a wide cross section of the public or a sizable subdivisions within the large public. So, public. so it really had a lot to do with age, religion, ethnic background. We still call it that today in terms of popular music. Tin Pan Alley pub was published um, sheet music. Again, sales increased with popularity of the phonograph. It helped the um, popular music become a mass medium. And then the new forms of popular music in the, again, 30s, 40s and the 50s jazz was improvisational and mostly instrumental music form. The crooners, this was my mom's generation because my mom actually um, played piano and she did in high school and she basically did um, a lot of the, the crooner songs, Frank Sinatra, that kind of stuff and really liked it. And then cover music was songs that were recorded or performed by another artist. So you, somebody made a song and then they covered it. And again, one I can think of is the Nine Inch Nails song that um, hurt that um, was performed by um, Johnny Cash. And a lot of people think Johnny Cash wrote that song, and it really it was Nine Inch Nails that wrote that song. So rock and roll emerged about with the uh, merging black sounds of rhythm and blues, gospel and blues guitar with the white influences of country folk and pop vocals in the 50s. And you think of Elvis, you think of some of the big um, players during that time. And again, it was influenced by social, cultural, economic, and political factors. A lot of people didn't like rock, rock and roll. It was banned in some places. The blues were really influenced by African-American spirituals, ballads, and work songs from the rural South. And it was the, the foundation of rock and roll. And rhythm and blues was the blues-based urban black music that was popular with teams. And this sort of started the integration of white and black cultures in terms of musically, for sure. So it's interesting to me because I love playing all three of those. I don't like any, any type of music that's uh, rhythmic like that. So rock did sort of change the, the perception of music and I guess you could say muddied the water as the book says. We had sort of a high and low culture aspect of it. So Chuck Berry, Elvis and Bo Diddley, again, weren't seen as a, as a high culture, it was seen as a low culture. Masculinity and femininity, uh, Little Richard and Elvis, or two that really sort of did the gender bending type of thing when it comes down to it. And then there was the country versus the city, which rockabilly had the combination of, of country or hillbilly music, Southern gospel and Mississippi Delta blues. Johnny um, Lee Lewis, or Jerry Lee Lewis, I think is one that sort of fits in that category a little bit too. Although he was, did play rock and roll too. Um, the North and the South, Southern culture and Northern listeners. And again, the key to spreading rock and roll was to find a white man who sounded black, which was sort of ridiculous in terms of the, when we think of today's um, music industry, 
but that was the way it was really in the 50s. Um, the sacred and the secular, again, uh, Ray Charles and Jerry Lee Lewis both were started playing gospel type of music and then moved into popular music, which was essentially rock and roll. So the battles that, that came about in, in um, music, really a lot of it when it first got rolling in the 50s, where there were DJs and Alan Freed and Dick Clark, they sort of helped rock gain acceptance during that time in the mid 50s and helped blur the racial lines and broke down other conventional boundaries. But a lot of the white cover versions often undermined black artist music. So they would make a song and then um, Pat Boone is one I think of that he would constantly cover other music from other artists that, you know, so they could kind of change it to make it look like, a, you know, he was singing it. And it, again, there's a big argument about cover songs back and forth. Payola scandals portrayed the rock and roll as corrupt industry because there was, um, again, payment to get your records paid, played on air. And again, that made it sort of a bribery type situation, but it wasn't legally prohibited, but it did really uh, make a big difference in terms of how rock and roll came about and the, the industry itself. The also fear of juvenile delinquency led to censorship of rock and roll. And supposedly again, delinquency was on the rise in the fifties and a lot of the music Elvis was banned. Some of the other ones were banned and they'd have, you know, some of the church groups didn't like rock and roll and thought it was the devil's music, et cetera, et cetera. In the mid sixties, and again, this was a little bit more my generation. I was in the, my, not my teen yet, but um, sort of eight, nine, 10 or something. Um, the Beatles invaded America in 64, and they followed the next year by Rolling Stones, Zombies, The Animals, Herman's Hermits, The Who, The Yardbirds, Them, and The Trogs. All those I was familiar with because there was music that was popular when I was a kid, and I still want to play some of those songs today, so I like doing it. And rock and roll sort of switched to become rock, so it sent popular music and industry in two different directions, really, at that point. The other cool thing that really happened in the mid 60s was the Motor City music, which Detroit gave us the American soul music. So soul was the merging of rhythm blues, gospel pop and early rock and roll. So Barry Gordy, Gordy was one of the big um, producers at the time and had Motown records in Detroit. It was an independent label. They were a successful group. They had the Supremes, Smokey Robinson, The Temptations, Mary Wells, The Four Tops, Martha and the Vandellas, Marvin Gaye, The Jackson Five. So all that, Michael Jackson basically got his start at that point too. It really was an interesting time in terms of musically because you had both rock and then you had soul at the same time sort of competing for each other when it came down to it. Not until the late 60s, I want to say 68, 69, did we start to get um, psychedelic music. The Beatles changed the psychedelic. Um, we had a lot of folk music. A lot of this was war protests from Vietnam War. There were songs performed by untrained musicians and passed down through oral Tradition was what the basis of folk music was, but it inspired protests. So we had sounds of social activism, Joan Baez, Arlo Guthrie, Phil Oaks, um, and Bob Dylan really turned that um, genre to go on. And then it sort of merged with folk rock. I think of the band, some of the, the songs by them were, were really um, a little bit sort of the, the folk type of, of genre. The other thing that happened again, the Beatles did go psychedelic, and then we also did, it was influenced by and I guess you could say brought down by drugs, but we had Jefferson Airplane, Jimi Hendrix, The Doors, The Grateful Dead. All those were sort of the psychedelic bands of the 60s and early 70s that were, you know, again, Hendrix is still the best guitar player ever when you put it down to it. But it was an interesting, an interesting time to be growing up. I was in my teens at that point. So punk didn't really come about till sort of the 80s. And I can remember it was the next thing that happened after disco, and I was not a big fan of disco, so the late 70s were really bad musically as far as I was concerned. But um, punk came around, around that time, so it sort of challenged the orthodoxy and commercialism of the record business with the Ramones, Blondie, the Talking Heads. And it wasn't until about 1990 that we started to get grunge, the, the Seattle sound, mm -hmm. with the messy guitar sound appearance, which I don't think it was all that messy in terms of guitar. I liked it, but. Uh, Nirvana, Green Day, Pearl Jam, Hole, um, Soundgarden, Nine Inch Nails, all those were part of the, the grunge um, movement in the, in the 90s. So also in the 90s, we sort of, in up into 2000, we started to get hip hop and hip hop really withdrew a lot of the musical lines too. So hip hop was the urban culture included rapping, cutting by DJs, break dancing, street clothing, poetry slams, graffiti art. It, it was sort of driven by a democratic non-professional spirit. Run DMC was big, Public Enemy was big, Eminem was big then, even big now. And 
the other one that really genre that happened to was the gangster rap, which addressed the gang violence, but also was sort of a target in terms of creating violence. So Tupac, Not Notorious, B.I.G., Big, 50 Cent, and Luby Fiasco, all those were part of the, the gangster rap when it started to come out. So the reemergence of pop also in the 2000s came out despite um, the emergence and popular of other forms of music, pop music still is there. It's still um, the biggest um, genre in, in some respects. iTunes made a big difference with that because they're the biggest uh, purveyor of pop music. And again, they, the single um, dominant unit of music because it got to the point I, iTunes did make a big difference in terms of changing that. And the streaming services did expand accessibility to music so anybody could get just any song in two seconds when you dump, when you search for it in your iTunes. The music labels also did influence the, the industry itself. An oligopoly is a business situation in which a few firms control most of the industry's production and distribution resources. So the U.S. and global music um, businesses really, you know, we control a lot of it just like we do television too, the same thing in film. Fewer major labels control more music at this point. We do have some indie labels that record music that seem to be less commercial, but everybody's always looking to spot the trends to play a major role in the music industry's risk takers. They want to do that as an independent one. And often though, sometimes when an independent um, producer or, or label comes about, um, they get bought by the major labels when they become successful. So that's one of the, the other things that happens pretty quickly in, in these days. So here's a market share of the major labels in 2016. This would be much different if we went to Best Work 2020. Independence are about 38%. Uh, Universal Music Group is a big one, 25%. Sony Music, 21%. And Warner Music Group's about 16%. So you can see there, there's really only three big players in the independence is what it boils down to. So how do we make and sell and profit from music? Again, how do we make it? We have to have an A&R, an artist and artist repertoire agent. Talent scouts, they discover, develop, and sometimes manage artists. Um, again, they drive the labels. How do we sell the music is, is obvious. We go through iTunes. Um, Anderson Merchandisers, which is Walmart, Best Buy. Amazon is another big one too. And the subscription services, we know that. So how do they really divide the profits? Depends on the medium. Um, the industry developed an equivalency standard. So the idea is they're supposed to be some method of how to do distribution in terms of the profits on it. Um, here's an idea of where the, the music actually, the money goes in the music when, say a CD, um, 20 bucks or 18 bucks. So the songwriter would only get like a dollar for each CD. The artist would get two bucks almost. The retailer about 540 and the music label about 975, 974. So on a digital download, this is where the big difference is, a songwriter will only get about a dime, the artist 20 cents, Apple gets 40, and the music label gets 60. So you can see how it takes a lot of streaming to get to the point compared to selling albums in terms of them making money. And again, the alternative labels, they're still surviving and it's still trying to thrive in terms of even by using the internet as low cost distribution and a promotional outlet. A lot of times you'll go to a concert and, or even a local bar band and they'll have their own published CDs or they'll actually already be streaming on Apple or any of the other um, streaming ones. So, so usually you can still reach um, the public and fans through social networking and video sites on actually on YouTube, obviously. And anytime you're on Facebook, they're doing a lot of um, Concerts online, which supposedly Facebook right now is in the, the time of not allowing um, live streaming of some concerts. Now there's a big issue with that going on. They're going to change for self-promotion. So that's not a good thing. And again, the music industry right now is having problems and the artists are having problems because again, there's no performances, which is a huge problem at this point. We're hoping that some of these venues don't um, go out of business. So Sound recording, free expression, democracy, there's always a battle over the controversial aspects to, to, um, that speaks to democratic expression. Again, they've tried to ban some albums in the past. We always have, you know, could you make a case for some rap music causes violence? I don't know. Could you make a, a case that rock and roll in the 50s caused juvenile and delinquency? You know, this is a back and forth battle. You could argue each case, each way, whichever way you want to do it. So again, popular music is upholding a legacy of the free expression while resisting the domination of these big companies. 
and it does really popular music speaks to individual universal things it's usually love there's other you know, when you think about songs that you like the blues rock and roll you know even people who like um again musicals like the frozen stuff all those kind of things it it really does speak and it is a universal theme for most people so let's hope at this point that music does get back live music at least gets back on its feet and we can go to production and we can actually go to concerts and it's going to be interesting the next year to see how many artists do survive and how many venues actually survive too because that's going to be a big big problem all right that was chapter four and i think we'll i'll do chapter five in a little bit and i'll put that one up too so thank you